Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger. In today's video, we're gonna look at a class action lawsuit that was just filed against Vanguard. You may recall that several weeks ago, I published a video describing how Vanguard had kind of thrown uh, its retail investors, that's folks like you and me under the bus when it comes to taxes, they'd made some changes to their target date retirement funds uh, that resulted in some pretty significant capital gains for those that own target date retirement funds in a brokerage or a taxable account. Well, last week, a plaintiff's class action lawsuit was filed in Pennsylvania. Now, I, as a litigator for 25 years, I defended class action lawsuits. I was usually on the defendant's side uh, of these types of lawsuits, but uh, I've dealt with them before. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to show you the complaint. We're going to walk through some of its more significant allegations. And then I'm going to kind of walk through what you can expect, what's going to happen or likely going to happen as the lawsuit progresses uh, through, through the stages. That will be particularly important for those of you that happen to have held uh, a Vanguard target date retirement fund in a brokerage account and incurred uh, s substantial taxes. So with that, let's get right to it. I'm gonna show you the, the, the lawsuit now, and I will have a link to this, uh, this document. It's a PDF uh, below the video. And so this is your a very typical uh, federal lawsuit. This is just uh, a cover sheet that goes with, with these types of lawsuits. But here's really basically the first page. As you can see, it's, it's in the United States District Court for the um, Eastern District of Pennsylvania. There are a number of defendants because these individuals are trustees of the funds, but the main defendant, of course, is the Vanguard Group right here. So what are they alleging? Well, let's get through the table of contents. And um, the first part is basically what I reported on uh, several weeks ago. Vanguard has sort of two tiers. You can see it right here. Two tiers of target date funds. One would be sort of an institutional class. That would be down here, they call it institutional funds. Those are uh, uh, pensions and large institutions that would hold $100 million or more uh, in a fund. So obviously, you know, you think large 401ks and that sort of thing. And then what the, the plaintiffs are calling retail funds, that's just the, the name they're, they're giving it. But those are, those are regular folk like you and me, uh, who if we had uh, uh, money in, in this type of fund, it would be less than $100 million. At least I can tell you that if I owned this fund, it, it would have less than $100 million in it. All right, so those are the two classes of target date retirement funds. And um, what happened was you can see here, investors who hold target date funds in tax advantaged accounts, think an IRA or 401k, can simply reinvest distributions without incurring uh, tax liability. But then this blue highlight, but Vanguard also markets and sells its target date funds directly to smaller ordinary investors who hold these funds in taxable accounts. And that's who this lawsuit is filed on behalf of. And it's interesting here, they say normally target date funds don't sell many assets. So capital gains distributions you know, from year to year are minimal. That is true. But beginning in December of 2020, Vanguard itself caused what, what the plaintiff's uh, lawyers here are calling an elephant stampede sell-off from its retail funds. And here's what happened. Vanguard chose to open its institutional funds, remember those are the, the, share, the class shares with more than 100 million, to all retirement plans with at least 5 million. So what Vanguard decided to do, which sounds like a good thing, was say, hey, it used to require $100 million to get into this special institutional class of, of shares with, and they have lower expenses, but we're gonna lower the threshold. It used to be 100 million. We're gonna lower it to 5 million, right? Now, what that happened was, as you can imagine, if, if you uh, were a pension or some institutional fund, and let's say you had 20 million, you didn't, you didn't qualify for the $100 million fund, but now because the Vanguard lowered the threshold to 5 million you do, so what happens? Well, you sell your shares in the retail uh, share class, and maybe this is in a 401k or some other sort of pension where there are no taxes uh, from doing this. You sell the, the retail shares and you buy now the institutional shares that they're available to you now because Vanguard lowered uh, the minimum and you get lower fees. Sounds like a good deal, right? And in fact, in paragraph five, it says, to raise cash to redeem so many shares, all these these uh, large institutional class funds selling to move into uh, the, the new institutional fund that, that allowed for uh, just a $5 million threshold. 
the retail funds, I'm reading right here, the retail funds were forced to sell off as much as 15% of their assets. When these assets were sold, the retail funds recognized capital gains on the assets. The resulting capital gain distribution to investors were unprecedented 40 times previous levels. Now, one of the big issues here, and this lawsuit covers it, we're going to look at it in a second, is, all right, fine, it had some negative effects on retail investors, but I mean, the overall attempt by Vanguard was positive. They were trying to lower the fees uh, for funds for a, a lot of folks, and that's not a bad thing. And, you know, if it caused what they're calling an elephant stampede, all these uh, institutions to sell from the retail fund, yeah, that's unfortunate, uh, but, but still, Vanguard's heart was in the right place. They were, they were trying to reduce fees. But what this lawsuit claims is, oh, no, 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 no. Vanguard had a way to accomplish the very thing uh, that it wanted to do without hurting retail investors. So let's check it out. Right here in the blue, Vanguard had other readily available ways to lower costs for retirement plans without hurting its taxable investors. What are those? Well, we got to scroll past these are all the defendants, by the way, mostly trustees, of course, Vanguard. Um, we've got to scroll past all of this, jurisdiction and venue. That's just uh, explaining why the federal court has jurisdiction over this. And they walk through some facts that we've just described already. And some actual charts in this lawsuit, which is kind of interesting. But we're going to get there. Here we go. Vanguard had a number of readily available options to avoid causing the problem. What is it? Well. Uh, the first thing they said was you can lower the retail fund fees for plans that had at least $5 million invested. That's the first alternative. In other words, what they're saying is you didn't have to have uh, those institutional investors that had, say, between $5 million and $100 million. You didn't have to do something that caused them to leave the retail fund and move over to the institutional fund. They could have stayed in the retail fund and simply had lower fees. You could have divided the retail fund in two effectively. So those with more than $5 million get a lower expense ratio. And then the rest of us with under $5 million uh, stay with the same expense ratio that we had. You could have effectively uh, split the fees in, into two groups, but kept everyone in the same retail fund. You wouldn't have had a problem. That's the first uh, option. The second option here, you could have uh, merged the retail and institutional funds. So you could have said, look, uh, we, we've got the retail fund here with high, slightly higher fees, the institutional fund here with lower fees. We're going to merge them together. It's not, a, it doesn't tr trigger any taxes for anybody. There's no, you know, elephant stampede out of one fund into another. We're going to merge them together. And again, we can have two different, effectively two different share classes in this merged fund. One for those with 5 million or more, they get a slightly lower fee. And then one for the rest of us uh, where we get a slightly higher fee. So that would have been the second option. But here's the kicker. It turns out that not only was this merger uh, option, this merge the two funds possible, but check this out. According to this complaint, nine months later, that's exactly what Vanguard did. After the harm had already been caused to retail investors who held these funds in a taxable account, Vanguard actually did this very thing right here. They merged the two funds. Of course, for those that had already incurred uh, the capital gains in 2021, it was too late. So pretty significant allegations because that would have been, I think, part of Vanguard's defense. We'll see. Maybe it still is. But what the complaint is saying is, look, look, you could have lowered these fees. You could have done exactly what you were trying to do without triggering uh, the sell-off. Now, one of the interesting things I found in this complaint, I mentioned some charts. Here's another one. This is actually directly from Morningstar. We've looked at these types of charts. This is showing the capital gains distribution, in this case of the Vanguard 2040 fund. Remember, they said it's 40 times uh, the normal distribution. And of course, you can see it right here in the chart. Pretty significant. Now, a couple of other things I want to uh, point out in this complaint before we turn to what I think is going to happen over the course of the litigation. Here, by the way, um, is the allegation saying, showing that they merged the two funds uh, uh, about nine months after uh, into, into 2021. Of course, the capital gains had already been triggered at this point. Now, one of the big questions is going to be, okay, maybe Vanguard didn't handle this so well, but did they actually breach a legal duty? And um, here they're quoting from Vanguard. 
uh, core to our mission to give core to our mission to give investors the best chance for investment success is our fiduciary duty to maximize long-term investment returns for our fund shareholders. And what the lawsuit basically says is, look, that describes as well as any of uh, the fiduciary duty uh, that Vanguard holds to its investors. And they allege that by doing what they did and triggering this elephant stampede, which caused the distribution of capital gains, they violated uh, this duty. That's the uh, in a nutshell. It's a very easy lawsuit, frankly, to understand. Uh, it's a very easy uh, story to tell. And uh, that's that's the story. And again, I will leave a copy of um, uh, this um, uh, lawsuit below the video. One of the other interesting uh, allegations that I highlight here in paragraph 62, when defendants decided to open up the institutional funds to plans with over 5 million, the mass sell-off was not just foreseeable, it was intended. That's what Vanguard wanted to happen. They wanted these uh, institutional investors that had between 5 million and 100 million, they wanted them to leave the retail fund and go over to the institutional uh, uh, fund. That was the whole point. They wanted them to benefit from uh, uh, the, the lower fees. So again, that's the, the, the lawsuit in, in a nutshell. Now the question is, all right, great, but like, what's gonna happen? How do, how do these class action lawsuits work? Well, uh, the first thing I expect to happen is that Vanguard will file what's called a motion to dismiss. What it basically says is, look, judge, we'll, we'll just assume for the sake of argument that everything in that lawsuit is absolutely correct and true. Uh, we still win. The plaintiffs have failed to state uh, a cause of action uh, that they can, they can win. And their argument will likely be that, that while some harm came to uh, some retail investors, uh, that Vanguard didn't actually breach its fiduciary duty, that all it did was lower the cost of a of, of separate type of fund. And it certainly, uh, uh, not only is, is that a legal thing to do, but actually a good thing for investors. And yes, it's unfortunate that it caused some tax consequences uh, for some retail investors, uh, but you know that's just sort of the risk that retail investors uh, take uh, when they invest in these types of funds uh, in a, a taxable account. I think they're going to make some attempt like that for motion to dismiss. Um, based on my experience, it will lose. It'll lose for a couple of reasons, I suspect. Again, we'll see what they actually file and what their arguments are. But a breach of fiduciary duty is kind of a, a mixed question of law and fact. And I would find it, it would surprise me if a judge in a motion to dismiss uh, would actually... Uh, side with Vanguard uh, in, in that type of argument. Um, but we'll see. I do expect um, Vanguard to file such a motion. I would if I were defending them, uh, uh, and, and I would expect them to do that. Now, if it does lose, the next sort of fight will be over the cla what's called class certification. This has been filed as a class action, uh, but right now it's got three plaintiffs. In fact, let me show you the harm to the three plaint plaintiffs. Uh, Actually, the first thing I'll show you is this. They put in here Van Vanguard's core purpose to take a stand for all investors, to treat them fairly, and to give them the best chance for investment success. From a PR perspective, this is a complete nightmare for Vanguard because they're going to have to balance defending this lawsuit without at the same time effectively saying, yeah, in these circumstances, we can throw the small-time retail investors under the bus. We have no, no legal obligation to protect them from this kind of harm. That's not exactly the core purpose uh, that Jack Bogle had in mind. And so that's going to be a tightrope that they're going to have to try to walk. Uh, but in terms of harm, here we go. They had three defendants. Uh, and the first one had a capital gains distribution, you can see here, of 60,000. Uh, the second defendant, Catherine Day, 80,000. And Anthony Pollock, um, 105,000. Right? So, but right now, the lawsuit is just on their behalf. It doesn't actually become a class action until the court certifies it as a class action. And so what will happen is there'll be motions filed to certify this as a class action. Vanguard will attempt to oppose uh, those motions. There is a what's called a federal rule of civil procedure. It happens to be number 23, if you know, you're keeping score at home, that governs uh, this. And uh, it, it has certain criteria. And the basic idea is 
one, are, are, are the members of this class, are there so many of them that it would, it would be impractical to litigate this one case at a time? That's clearly going to be true here. And then the question is, well, are there enough um, legal and factual issues that are identical for all of the individuals that would be in this class uh, to, to make it, you know, make it sen make sense to certify this as a class action? Again, there's going to be a lot of briefing on this. It's always a big fight in a, in a class action. Based on what I've seen in the complaint, uh, I think it probably favors the plaintiffs here. I think there's probably a good case for class certification. If it does get certified as a class action, sort of the next big fight will be discovery. That's where each side can request information from the other. And here's going to be the interesting question. Did Vanguard know that this was a likely outcome when they made the decision to lower the fees? Now, they're going to be a, there's going to be a big fight over attorney-client privilege because if there's a, um, a lot of analysis going on within Vanguard about this, it no doubt involved lawyers. And uh, so there will no doubt be claims uh, that some material they don't have to produce because of attorney-client privilege. By the way, in a lawsuit, when you withhold information based on attorney-client privilege, you have to produce what's called a privilege log that basically lists all of the documents you're withholding, some basic information about them, so that the court can evaluate whether uh, your claim of privilege is justified. But here's the deal. If this was an ongoing issue and discussion within Vanguard, there's going to be plenty of email. And that's what's going to be really interesting is the email in this case. Are there folks at Vanguard saying, oh my goodness, we can't just lower this. Why aren't we merging the two funds? This is going to cause a huge capital uh, gains distribution to retail investors, and that's just wrong. That will be interesting. And I would suspect, just again, on my experience, I don't have any personal knowledge of, you know, obviously uh, what happened at Vanguard on this, but I would be really surprised if there aren't some really damning emails at Vanguard on this issue. So discovery, the question of privilege is going to be a big, big fight. Through all of this, uh, I suspect there will be, uh, if it gets, particularly if class, uh, that class action gets certified, there will be, um, you know, settlement uh, discussions. And here, uh, this gets tricky because uh, every situation on the damages front could be different, right? Not, not in the amount. Certainly the amount of capital gains distribution is going to uh, vary depending on how much uh, retail investors had invested. That's easy to deal with. What's, what's more difficult is uh, what the damages should be because it raises the question, well, when would you have sold some of your shares of this fund? Because eventually, presumably, you're going to sell some of these funds to live on in retirement. That's going to trigger capital gains tax. So, you know, it's not that you would have never paid this, the taxes, but that the timing, you would have paid it maybe over a, a longer period of time, maybe 10, 20, 30 years from now. Then again, there could be some that uh, leave some of these assets to heirs and they get stepped up basis. And of course, you've always got the possibility that the, the tax rates could change even for capital gains uh, over time. So that gets tricky. And um, that's not an easy answer to, um, uh, I think, an easy question to answer and could pose some problems for, for, for the plaintiffs. I think in the context of a settlement, uh, you know, you could figure out ways to, to deal with that. And um, it, it could be, you know, it could be, for example, uh, uh, an amount based on a percentage of the taxes paid that somehow um, reflect uh, the, the, the time between having to pay them now and pay them, paying the taxes over time, say in retirement. But again, a very tricky issue. But here's how it works. If they do get a class certification and they do come up with a settlement, uh, all the members of the class, which would be you know, potential members of the class, all of the individuals that owned these funds in taxable accounts will be notified. You, you know, you've probably seen it with other consumer class actions where you get that card in the mail that says, if you bought the such and such a coffee maker between this time and that time, you're entitled to a $25 rebate or something like that. You'll get that kind of card or notification uh, in the mail, and you have an option. You can opt out. You can say, no, thank you. I don't want to be part of this. I want to sue, potentially, Vanguard on my own. That's probably not the choice most members of a class make, but that is an option. Or if you're happy with the settlement, if it comes to that, uh, you know, you could, of course, uh, accept it and be part of it. Now, again, I'm getting, that's way down the road. We've still got to do the motion to dismiss the motion to certify the class, there's going to be discovery. 
And who knows? Vanguard, in theory, could choose to fight this. I do think this is a PR nightmare for Vanguard. Because again, if they're going to argue, hey, we have a fiduciary duty, but it wasn't triggered here, we can intentionally uh, take, take action that's going to cause significant capital distributions, not to the big guys, not to the institutional funds, but to the, you know, the regular folk like you and me in our retail brokerage accounts, and it can cause significant tax liability. And we don't have to answer for that. We can do that all day long if we want to, and we have no accountability to the little guy. Is that the kind of message Vanguard wants to send? So this is a PR nightmare for Vanguard. How they're gonna to respond to it, I think, will be very telling uh, as to um, sort of how Vanguard thinks about its place in um, in, in the financial services and, you know, is it effectively, is it become a company that just caters to the, the, the big, the big institutions, or is it also there for the little guys, uh, as, as well? And that's really what this lawsuit, it's kind of how this lawsuit has been angled in the complaint. They're basically sort of D David and Goliath kind of, kind of, um, vibe that I get from it. And uh, I don't blame them. That's exactly how I would, uh, position this lawsuit if I were representing the plaintiffs as well. Well, there you go. I know I've thrown a lot at you. Uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it and see how it unfolds. Again, uh, a link to the PDF of the lawsuit will be below this video. If you have questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll do my best uh, to help you out any way I can. And until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is probably not a Vanguard Target date retirement fund is a taxable account, uh, but it is financial freedom.